Hi, everyone. I get to introduce Dr. Kate Starbird, who is a um, associate professor in human-centered design and engineering and the co-founder of the Center for Informed Public. Her, her work and her, her lecture is relevant to all of us in the sense that she's talking about how we use social media and how social media is used and misused during, um, during times of crisis. So it's perfectly relevant for, for 2020. So she's gonna talk about the difference between misinformation and disinformation and, and how we operate during times of crisis, COVID-19. And she's gonna talk about the upcoming election and how information and misinformation shapes the fundamentals of our, of our democracy. So follow Kate's lecture all the way through because she's talking about some really important things that are relevant to us. So a couple of questions that I have for you after you listen to, um, to Dr. To Dr. Starbuck's lecture is this. What is the difference that you learn between misinformation and disinformation? So for you, what's the difference between misinformation and disinformation given what you've learned for her? Can you think of some examples of misinformation and disinformation that you've received? or even that you've, that you've put out there. The second question I have for you is, what are some steps that you can take as a social media user? What are steps that you can take to curve the spread of misinformation or disinformation? And how can you make our community better through your own use of, of social media? So the question would be, what are some steps that you can take to curb the spread, to stop the spread of misinformation and disinformation? And what are some things that you can do in your own personal use of social media to, to make your community better, to make people around you better, and to share information that helps us become a better community? Thank you. Hi, my name is Kate Starbird, and I'm an associate professor at the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering, or HCDE. At HCDE, we teach engineers how to talk to people before they build things so that we build the right things. We also teach our students to think deeply about how the things we build affect people in both positive and negative ways, individually and at scale, across, in some cases, billions of users around the globe. As you probably know, many UW faculty members don't just teach, but we also do research. My research is in the field of human-computer interaction. It sits at the intersection between people and technology, or between computer science and social science. And I study how all these platforms and devices we use, like our phones and our laptops and all those things, shape the ways that we live, learn, so socialize, etc. In particular, my research looks at how people use social media and other technologies during crisis events. We call this subfield of study crisis informatics. During my PhD dissertation, I focus on all the pro-social things that people do on social media during crisis events like natural disasters. For instance, like sharing information with each other, reaching out to help people. Sometimes people use social media to help people in their own commun communities. Like the old friend whom I hadn't seen in years who lent me an air, air filter a few weeks ago when I posted on social media that I was having trouble with the smoke. Um, but in other cases, people use social media to organize volunteer efforts to help people halfway around the world. And we really see these amazing things happen um, using these technologies during these horrible times. So we can see the best of, humor, best of human behavior in the worst of times. My early research examined digital volunteerism, but more recently my work has begun to focus on some of the less pro-social things that people do online during crisis events, like spreading rumors, misinformation, and disinformation. I say my research, but I don't work alone at all. My lab includes graduate students and even undergraduate students, often through directed research groups or these four credit research opportunities that we have at HCDE. And if you're interested in that, please let me know. Um, we're always looking for great students. And we work together on this research, our students and other colleagues. Over the past several years, we've also worked closely with colleagues at the UW iSchool, especially my longtime collaborator, Emma Spiro. With Dr. Spiro and other colleagues at the iSchool and Law School in December of 2019, we founded the UW Center for an Informed Public. And our mission there is to understand and resist strategic misinformation, to promote an informed society and strengthen democratic discourse. As you can imagine, the COVID-19 pandemic and election 2020 are keeping us very busy. Before we get into COVID-19 and election 2020, let's look at misinformation from a simpler time. I wonder if any of you have seen this image before. I certainly have. As a researcher of social media during crisis events, I've seen the same shark ostensibly swimming in the floodwaters of just about every hurricane since 2012. This one was from Hurricane Harvey in 2017. It was actually posted from a guy who claimed to be a blogger or a journalist. He had both in his profile. He actually knew it wasn't true when he sent it, 
Um, but he posted it. He went to bed one night uh, in Scotland and woke up the next morning. It had received 150,000 likes or something close to that and nearly 90,000 retweets. Um, he also woke up to a, a bunch of phone calls from uh, other journalists who wanted to talk to him about why he had spread this misinformation. Uh, and he talked about, you know, some of the motivations and in, in, in he was trying to be funny. He thought it was a good lesson for people. And we can also assume he was trying to get attention, which clearly he did a good job with. Um, social media affords this kind of thing, and we see it often in, in crisis events. We kind of have a name for this kind of rumor, the clickbait type of rumor that happens during crisis events. But there are other kinds of rumors as well. So tweeting about sharks and floodwaters seems relatively harmless and kind of funny. Um, I imagine that many of you have seen um, or been seeing uh, misinformation more recently, especially misinformation about COVID-19, that may be more concerning. For example, I imagine some of you remember this one. It was from early March. Um, the idea of this post was that the lockdown was coming. The National Guard was on its way to enforce martial law and that you better go get your groceries before it's too late because all the grocery stores are gonna close. And of course, there was a big rush to the grocery stores. Um, I saw this on my own Facebook feed. I also received a phone call from a family member who said, oh, I heard from a friend of a friend, it's really important, you better get to the grocery store as soon as possible. Um, so this was probably exactly the wrong thing to do at that moment, was for all of us to rush to the grocery stores just as COVID-19 is starting to spread and all kind of congregate in one place. So it was actually potentially harmful, even though the people that were spreading it were probably trying to help um, help uh, their friends to, to help them do the right thing. And so we can see um, this kind of well-meaning rumor as one of the things, one of the kinds of misinformation we often see during crisis events. As the weeks, weeks dragged on with COVID-19, you probably saw more stuff like this, conspiracy theories, like this false claim that 5G technologies cause the symptoms that we associate with COVID-19. You might have even noticed how the science was used. People would post um, links to scientific articles and, um, and so try to, to use these scientific articles to support their ideas. Of course, we can find that they're, they're misusing the scientific articles or there's articles that are that are retracted, that turn out to be untrue. Um, and that science was often misinterpreted purposefully to push, to push false information and including conspiracy theories and politicized narratives that kind of tried to support a particular political position in, in relation to the virus. Of course, there were and still are real world consequences of these false and misleading narratives. For example, anti-mask protests that we were seeing in the spring and into the summer and just people more generally ignoring the social distancing guidelines because they either don't believe or they choose not um, to, to think about uh, and trust um, the information that shows just how dangerous this virus is. And you may, have often, uh, you may also have seen um, things like this. This is one of the more troubling things I saw this summer. I was walking near my home in Seattle. I took this picture um, and, it, and it says, it's graffiti that says Bill Gates is a killer. Uh, and this, uh, is just a real world manifestation of the false claims that COVID-19 was engineered by Bill Gates as a plot to rule the world. I mean, it just, it sounds baffling and yet um, it began to take root online and not just in places across the world, but also in our, own, in our own neighborhoods. And as a longtime resident of Seattle, like many of you, I recognize that Bill Gates and his family have given much to our community, and they've also um, supported public health, health initiatives around the world that have saved countless lives. Um, so to see this kind of statement just blocks away from my home, just blocks away from the Gates Foundation, was extremely troubling and really shows the impact of pervasive misinformation. So as you all can probably tell, rumors, misinformation, disinformation are part of the online discourse during crisis events. But this isn't new. It didn't just show up with the internet. Rumors have always been common during crisis events. It's one of the ways that we deal with the event itself. And so we're vulnerable, particularly vulnerable during crisis events to um, different kinds of, of misinformation for a couple of different reasons. The first are, when a crisis happens, they're usually characterized by uncertainty. We don't know exactly what happened. How many, you know, if it's an earthquake or a hurricane, how many lives were lost? Where's the damage? Where, where can I go for shelter? Um, for COVID-19, we've got other concerns like, uh, you know, how, how deadly is the disease? How does it spread? So there's this uncertainty and we don't like uncertainty. Um, and so we have this anxiety about 
sort of how should we respond? What action should we take? How do we protect ourselves? How do we protect our families and our communities? And so we have this, this uncertainty and, and, and anxiety, and we want to resolve that un uncertainty and anxiety. And what we do to resolve it is we come together and we try to make sense of things. We try to make, we try to get rid of the uncertainty and add order to it. And we, there's this process that's known as collective sense making, where people um, they come together, they share information, they come up with explanations, they come they come up with speculation theories about what might be happening and and how and and, and how they should and how they should respond to it. And sometimes that collective sense making process can go awry. Um, so it, it generates rumors, and rumors can turn out to be true sometimes, but often rumors turn out to be false. And so this collective sense making process can sort of stir or spin the rumor mill, and can and it actually lead to the spread of misinformation. At the same time, people who might want to exploit us can use crisis events as opportunities to do that. And so they target these events and even they target our sense-making activities to try to shape those activities um, towards their own objectives. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go on. So it turns out that COVID-19 is kind of a perfect storm for mis- and disinformation. We have this, per this long period of persistent uncertainty and even though, you know, seven months in or whatever we are, it seems to be resolving a little bit, we still have uncertainty, scientific uncertainty about, you know, how, uh, how deadly is the disease? How does it spread? How is it going to evolve? Um, how, are the, how are vaccines going to help? How effective are masks? Um, how effective are social distancing measures? What actions should we take um, right now in the future? And so we have this long period of, 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 of persistent un uncertainty. And, and and even just scientific uncertainty where the answers just really weren't known. And we don't like that. And, we, and so we tried to, to, to come up with ways to explain that away. And so that you know, becomes this kind of part of the vulnerability. We also have prolonged and acute impacts to our lives. Um, people have lost loved ones, they've been sick. Um, we've they had financial impacts. People have lost their businesses, their jobs. And so that's part of what's making this a perfect storm, as is this growing distrust in authorities that didn't just start with COVID-19. It didn't just start, you know, in the last few years. It's, it's been growing for a long time where we don't really we don't really necessarily trust um, the people that we, we would want to, to turn to to trust during these these times. And that's something that's even probably grown worse during COVID-19. We also have this problem of dis displaced gatekeepers because of the way that technology has changed how we get information. Um, we used to go to specific sources who, who a lot of people, a majority of people thought they could trust. So once upon a time, you might not remember this, but there were three or four news stations and everybody would get about a half an hour or an hour's worth of news from those stations about every day. And that was about it. Um, and there might be a few newspapers or, th or things that they got information from. Well, now we can get information from all sorts of sources, which is great in terms of diversity of, of, of information. But it also means that a lot of opportunity for misinformation, false information, and outright dangerous information to sneak into our information diets. At the same time, there's a heavily politicized information space. And this means that, that not only are people trying to target sense-making activities to kind of shape them towards political goals, it also means, and I'll try to explain this as we go, that we're particular, particularly vulnerable when we are inside our political identities or our social identities towards being manipulated in certain kinds of ways and coming up with conclusions that might not actually be accurate. And so you take all these things together and part of it's about human nature, part of it's about COVID-19, and part of it's about this, this particular moment we're in, both politically and informationally, the way our information space is shaped that is making us, um, that are all these factors are making us particularly vulnerable right now. And we're seeing that manifest as, as a lot of misinformation. Let me switch gears here to talk a little bit about our methods, the tools and techniques we use to do our research. Our methods are kind of our special sauce. They're one of the primary reasons that we ended up stumbling into online disinformation four or five years ago, which is something that my lab is currently known for. Our work builds off of methodological innovation in crisis informatics and the study of online rumors. Our methods are profoundly mixed in the sense of blending both qualitative and quantitative approaches. We conduct iterative, interpretive analysis of social media data and other online content. We look at the data from different perspectives, using high-level quantifications and visualizations to identify patterns and anomalies, but we're also willing and 
anxious to roll up our sleeves and dive into the data, to analyze by hand or manually thousands of data points of content to really understand what's going on um, within some of the phenomena that we're looking at. We repeatedly go back and forth between views at 10,000 feet and tweet by tweet. And speaking of tweets, to some extent, almost all of our studies are cross-platform. We're looking at Facebook and YouTube and Medium and TikTok. Um, but the seed data is often Twitter data because it's public. It's something we can easily, easily collect. And we start there, and then we begin to map out the other relationships between, um, between platforms and how content moves across platforms. So let me show you a few examples to kind of show you how we work. All right, so here's our first example. This is actually a graph that we created from data related to um, COVID-19. It's actually how an, a misleading article about the science of COVID-19 went viral on Twitter in, um, I believe it was March. Uh, the, technique, so the, the technique we're using here was actually developed in a previous study led by undergraduate researcher Caitlin Zhou. Uh, and um, so let me explain what's going on here. So time on this graph is on, along the x-axis and it runs left to right. Uh, on the y-axis is the number of tweets uh, at the, uh, the number of tweets that linked to this particular medium article at, at any point in time. And so um, on top of that, we've also graphed where each tweet is. And so um, individual tweets here are, um, are circles or, or diamonds on the graph, and they're sized by the number of followers that the account had. Uh, so, so accounts with more followers rep are represented by a large um, a large circle or a large shape, and accounts with less followers are a small shape. Uh, and the and graph in red red ones, I think, are original tweets. So they are somebody who just linked to the the website um, and made their own tweet. Whereas blue circles are retweets, and diamonds are actually quote tweets, but there weren't very many in here. And so what this actually shows um, is how the information this this kind of graph allows us to see how information. Um, spreads and how it moves through high follower accounts often uh, to take off. And so what you actually see, if you look really close here at the bottom left corner of the graph, is this, this Medium article wasn't getting a lot of pickup. It wasn't really spreading very fast. There's a couple hundred uh, tweets and retweets for the first few hours. But then all of a sudden, it just takes off when these high follower accounts begin to tweet and retweet it. And it takes off for several hours. Um, and what actually happens is these are conservative cable news pundits with these very large million follower uh, audiences have retweeted it. And then it begins to, it begins to really spread through the... Um, through conservative uh, cable news pundits and right-wing influencers in this case. And eventually it was corrected about where that, that really strong red dot is actually two or three tweets from a journalist who's correcting the information. And then it slows down and it doesn't spread anymore. So you actually see, you know, it's not spreading very fast. And then all of a sudden it just really takes off. So this is something we've, we've been using again and again and again, this kind of technique to, to not just see, you know, what's spreading, but how is a certain kind of piece of information spreading? And it helps us, and we don't just look at the, the graph, we actually look at the graph and then we kind of, we can click on the tweets and go see who they are and, what, and who's tweeting what when, which turns out to be really important for understanding how information spreads. This is a different kind of visualization. It's a network graph. It shows the relationships between different kinds of entities. And in this network graph, we're actually looking at content sharing between different websites. So each circle or node is a website, and each edge between them is formed when two websites, in this case, published the same article. Uh, so the edge gets thicker when they published multiple, you know, uh, they both published the same article many times. Uh, in this case, the underlining data are articles shared via Twitter in the context of the civil war in Syria. And when we, go, when we go read those articles, we find that they include disinformation about the conflict and that this network of alternative media websites were publishing content that was actually part of a disinformation campaign. And so we begin to see this network take, take shape where the same articles are moving across different kinds of websites. They include conspiracy theory websites, hyperpartisan media, state-controlled outlets from Russia and Iran and some other countries. And these websites routinely share content with each other. So the same article might appear on RT and Sputnik, Sputnik News, as well as Global Research, Mint Press News, 21st Century Wire, and a range of other sites. 
in that example I just gave, the first two are state-controlled media from Russia. The third is a longtime Russian disinformation and conspiracy theory website. The fourth has connections to the Iranian government. And the fifth is an alt-right clickbait site that spreads conspiracy theories, including ones about COVID-19. So this content sharing ecosystem allows for the same content to get packaged up uh, for different kinds of audiences and almost micro-targeted. So if you care about left-leaning politics, you may have actually seen this content through Mint Press News. And if you were a right-wing person, you might have seen it through some of the pro-patriot sites or the Veterans uh, Today site that are in here as well. Uh, and so th this different kinds of misinformation, in this case disinformation, gets packaged up for different audiences. And this can actually create a kind of false triangulation, which our researchers actually experienced when they were studying this, where they read articles and they thought that they were seeing this similar kinds of things in different places. So they thought they were doing their due diligence. Um, they were just many of you might go do your own research. And they thought they were doing their own research, seeing these different, the same kind of ideas in different places. And it began to think, oh, this must be true. I've seen the same thing in different places. And then we realized it was literally the same thing that was being copied and pasted. So it, it tricks our, our mechanisms for trying to make sense of information. And it, it can actually um, kind of... Uh, jam our, our, our best practices for media literacy. And it's actually designed in some ways to take advantage of that. So this case shows, you know, sort of like, um, we could tell an interesting story. We've got this graph, which actually represents something which we use to learn more about what was going on and which actually can serve to communicate about, um, about disinformation in general and disinformation around this particular event. Okay. The th uh, my third example here is another kind of network graph, uh, and this one is used is created with a different property. Uh, it's a retweet network graph, and it's generated from data related to I don't know if you'll remember this the pandemic video, which came out in May. It was a video that included many different kinds of conspiracy theories, and um, the conspiracy theories about the coronavirus in particular. And in in this graph, each node or circle is actually a Twitter account. And they're sized according to how many retweets they, uh, they received. And they're connected by an edge when one node retweeted another node. And, then, and so we create this graph. And the next thing we did was we used a community detection algorithm to identify different clusters of accounts that shared similar retweet patterns. And so those, those clusters are, are in the different colors. And then we went in and we read the, the different um, user descriptions. And we used some other kinds of techniques to kind of see what the different what the different clusters were. And based on account descriptions of the users in each cluster, we found five major sort of distinct clusters. Um, and we later mapped how misinformation or, or the conspiracy theory, the pandemic video, spread across these different um, groups. And we could see that it um, started sort of in the anti-vaccine communities um, and spread over to the conspiracy theory communities. And then it went out through hyper-partisan media websites that are designed um, for people, they were they're designed sort of a political, a strong political bent. Um, so they went out through hyper-partisan media, especially in this case on the conservative side, and into more mainstream conservative and pro-Trump communities. And so this graph shows sort of structurally how false information moved across different communities, in this case on Twitter, but we actually can do similar things with Facebook data and, sh and show a, a similar kind of structural relationship between different sort of ideological communities that began to come together and form connections. Uh, and those connections uh, were used to spread this video, and then those connections were were used repeatedly to spread other misinformation about the coronavirus. So this is again, it's just another example of the kinds of ways that we might look at data to understand what's going on with the spread of information, the spread of misinformation, and the spread of disinformation and conspiracy theories. So I mentioned earlier about how misinformation spreads during crisis events and about how COVID-19 is an example of sort of a perfect storm crisis event for misinformation. But election 2020 is kind of a crisis event as well, due in part to the unprecedented and dynamic impacts of COVID-19, the uncertainty that we may have due to delays in counting mail-in votes in this sort of way that we've never, um, we've never done before in many states, the fact that political influencers are sowing distrust in the results, and the fact, again, that we have this sort of heavy, heavily politicized and polarized information space. 
So I want to talk a little bit now about election 2020. And I've, I've talked above or earlier about misinformation versus, you know, and I use these different terms, misinformation, disinformation, uh, but I want to unpack them a, a bit because they actually mean pretty different things. And those differences are really important, especially when we start to think about a political crisis. So misinformation is information that's false, but not necessarily intentionally false. Like some of those rumors I described above where people were maybe trying to, to do the right thing and they were accidentally spreading misinformation. Disinformation on the other hand is false or misleading information that is purposefully seeded or spread for a specific objective, like a financial objective, a political objective, a reputational objective or something similar. Disinformation actually has historical connections to active measures techniques that were used in particular by Soviet um, intelligence, but also other um, countries around the world and have sort of, um, there's a strategy around them uh, and, and they're used in particular ways to, uh, for different kinds of political outcomes. So one of the things that I wanna talk about um, is uh, that we actually kind of tend to think that, that disinformation and political propaganda is someone else's problem and that it actually doesn't affect us. Well, I wanna talk to you about um, maybe a different perspective. And that is, I think that we are all vulnerable to spreading misinformation and disinformation, especially when we engage online within our political identities. So I'm gonna tell you a story about 2016 based on research led by another undergraduate in our lab, uh, Leo Stewart. And Leo was looking at um, the Black Lives Matter conversation in 2016. And we were trying to understand um, how different kinds of narratives were developing around Black Lives Matter, both sort of the, the supportive narratives of people that were you know, trying to um, organize and, and um, against, organize against uh, violence by police and sort of systemic racism in America, and then sort of a counter, a counter set of narratives um, that, that were people that were trying to challenge and denigrate the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter message. And what we did was we actually went and looked online, we're looking at Twitter data to look at kind of the structure of, of that conversation. And this is another one of those retweet graphs I've talked about before, a little bit above. In this case, each little circle is a Twitter account and they're closer together when they retweeted each other and they're further apart if they didn't retweet each other. And what this, this shows structurally is a very polarized conversation. We had pro-Black Lives Matter accounts kind of talking to themselves on the left and anti-Black Lives Matter accounts talking to themselves and retweeting themselves on the right. And this isn't particularly surprising. We see that with a lot of different conversations. And so we actually wrote a paper about sort of the, the different narratives that were emerging on these different sides and how, you know, different things were framed in different ways and, um, and looking at in particular how, you know, some divisive messaging uh, was arising in, in juxtaposition, especially on the political right. Um, but we were seeing, you know, similar things that might've been problematic on the left too. In 2000, we published this paper in 2017 in about November. And um, two weeks after we published it, and this is like in the context of 2000, the, the study was in 2016, around the time that the political, that the election was happening. And, and then we, we published it right at the time when um, the US intelligence committees were trying to understand how Russia had interfered in the US election in 2016. And they published a report and they actually, with that report, um, uh, they being the House uh, Intelligence Committee, um, had talked to Twitter and Twitter gave them a list of accounts that they had identified were, were troll accounts run by Russian agents in the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russia. And they, and they put out these accounts and, and they published them. And then we went and looked at those accounts. <laughs> and actually, I remember, I remember the night, I remember sitting there and I looked at the accounts and I said, Holy moly, we've seen these accounts before. And these accounts, uh, I recognize them. I, I recognize them from our research paper. We'd actually used examples from some of the Russian troll accounts in our conversations about Black Lives Matter discourse, which was a very sort of US-centered discourse. Um, and so I sent the list over to, to Leo and I said, Leo, go tell me where the Russian accounts are in this conversation. And he sent me the graph and, at, you know, maybe this graph looks normal to us now, but when he sent me this graph, I said, no, no, that's not the graph. Send me another one. And he said, no, no, Kate, this is, this is the graph. And so what actually we found is that the Russian trolls had infiltrated both sides of the Black Lives Matter discourse. And they were um, active on both sides. They were being retweeted. 
Um, in fact, on some of, in some cases, they became some of the influential accounts in this space. We had another student, a PhD student, who went in and tried to understand what were these accounts and what were they trying to do. And he was he did in depth qualitative research, really looking at the accounts, all their their behaviors, and he found that these trolls enacted multi dimensional online personas across platforms. They weren't just on Twitter; they were on Facebook, Instagram, SoundCloud, um, all sorts of different things. And they were playing on stereotypes of African Americans on one side and white US conservatives on the other. They were impersonating activists and also modeling for others what online activism looked like. They were reflecting norms, but also to some extent shaping those. Often their content wasn't superficially problematic or any different from what others in the space were doing. So they were tweeting about strong black voices on the left or support of US military veterans on the right. They were cultivating audiences. They were trying to look like us to get other people to, to follow them, to get US citizens to follow them for future strategic messaging. In other places, they were, you know, some of their other accounts were sowing and amplifying division. Some of their content was actually some of the most vitriolic content in the space, advocating for violence against police on the left and using racial epithets on the right. They were enacting the worst caricatures of US online participants that you can imagine. In a few places, we can see them holding arguments with themselves, like a puppeteer having one of their accounts on the left fight with one of their accounts on the right. So what, is this, what does this mean to us? What, why does this matter? Why does it matter that, 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 uh, that for, foreign operatives are coming into our already polarized discussions and trying, and trying to aggravate them and, and pull us apart even further and actually kind of seizing on real divisions in our society to try to make them worse, to amplify them and use them for their advantage. So I wanna say, and I, and I said this before, we're, all, we're vulnerable to spreading mis and disinformation when, we're, when we engage in our political identities. And most of us do this. So many of us are probably somewhere in this graph. If you were active on Twitter, you probably, some of you might be too young for that, um, but you may be active right now in some of these conversations and vulnerable in the same ways. So Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, retweeted one of the Russian trolls, one of the Russian troll accounts in orange uh, on the left side of the graph, on the pro-Black pro Lives Matter side of the graph. And so did I. One of the things we've seen is that online activist communities are specifically targeted by disinformation campaigns, both foreign and domestic, because we're engaged, we're angry, we're outraged, we're rightfully outraged, and they understand that they can shape that outrage towards their objectives. We've seen um, from Black Lives Matter to Blue Lives Matter to veterans communities to LGBT groups to MAGA groups, they impersonate Americans, infiltrate our communities, and try to shape our discourse towards their objectives. And they're not just foreign agents. We see this domestically as well. We see domestic groups trying to do some of these same things. Um, and we can see that going on right now. And why does this matter, right? So pervasive disinformation, regardless of the intentions of those who wield it, is actually a threat to democracy. It targets the hearts and minds of a population. It can shape our perceptions of reality in ways that align with somebody else's objectives. It undermines trust in information. It undermines trust in institutions. Uh, it undermines trust in our government, it undermines trust in our elections, it undermines our trust in each other. It destabilizes the common ground that democratic societies need to stand upon to govern ourselves. And it doesn't let us address the actual problems because it's not there to constructively build up, you know, build ourselves up and, and, and find what's wrong and solve it. It's there to have us kind of break ourselves apart into factions uh, and, and not be able to, to heal the, the, the places that are broken. So disinformation doesn't come from just come from boring governments. I've mentioned that are, uh, already, and the tools are available to just about anyone nowadays. Um, and right now, if we look at disinformation in the context of 2020, most of it isn't coming from Russia or some other boogeyman somewhere else. Most of it is coming from within, from domestic groups that are trying to flood the space with misleading information for their political objectives. Um, in particular, domestic disinformation campaigns are using false and misleading narratives um, to, to suppress votes and to undermine trust in the election results. And we're cur currently experiencing this and seeing it over and over again in some of the work we're doing to sort of in real time track mis and disinformation about the election. And I'm gonna show you a, a couple of examples. Much of this has been around mail-in ballots uh, and, it, and it's gonna come to a head in the next few weeks as, as we all experience what uh, this, this crisis of an election. 
So this is a tweet that actually was sent in early September. It was sent by a person who does not live in California. He said that he hasn't lived there in 10 years and that his um, parents just received a ballot for him in California. So he decides this is, an, uh, you know, this is just proof that the elections are not going to be um, safe. So it turns out this is a, a false tweet. Uh, he did not receive a ballot. He might have thought he did, but it was just an information card. But that didn't start, stop this tweet from going viral. It began to spread very quickly immediately after he posted it. Um, it, it got more than 10,000 tweets in about six hours. Uh, and then um, in total, like 22,000 retweets, I think. And it could have been an honest mistake, except that we now know that the author works for a conservative political organization. Uh, and he might have been motivated to share this, or even perhaps maybe he made the mistake because this kind of message already aligned with his idea that the election, well, not his idea, but this sort of campaign that's been run to undermine our trust in, in, um, in mail-in voting. And, in, and when he saw what he thought was a ballot, he interpreted it in that way and spread it. So he's kind of like his own preconceptions and his political activism perhaps caused him to make a mistake, but this mistake got amplified and furthered our distrust in the mail-in process. Here's another example. This was just sent a few weeks ago, and we actually did some real-time analysis and helped it get um, taken down from Twitter. But it was this picture of um, a thousand mail-in ballots found in the dumpster. And actually, President Trump mentioned this in one of his um, speeches recently as an example of why we can't trust uh, the mail-in vote. But turns out this photograph um, was... Uh, was not true, and it was uh, it was ballots found in a dumpster. They were just from 2018. They actually weren't 2020 ballots. They have nothing to do with mail-in fraud or even mistakes in mail-in ballots or anything else. But the tweet it didn't stop the tweet from from spreading. Again, uh, thousands and thousands of retweets spread very um, widely on hyperpartisan media outlets as well that are kind of invested in sowing doubt in the election results. And again, just just another example. And we we found like we've found dozens of these kinds of examples where we where they're taking mistakes or things that they think are mistakes, or they're taking photos out of content text to try to sow distrust in the election results. And this, you know, sowing trust in election results that is classic disinformation. Here's another one. This one has a couple of interesting elements. Um, it's it's uh, trying to th sh uh, throw doubt on mail-in drop boxes, which many people are using for convenience to and because they don't trust the, the the post office, and so they're putting they want to put it in the mail drop boxes. Uh, and, and this tweet is claiming that those are a voter security disaster. It's, it doesn't have any evidence behind that, um, but it says that it's going to allow people to vote multiple times. Um, it's suggesting that they are more likely to put them in, in the areas of Democrats and so, or maybe Republicans. So they, um, they're, they're suggesting that some kind of partisan nature behind it. And then it actually has a threat of COVID. It says, are they even COVID sanitized? So they're actually suggesting you might catch COVID from using one of these. So it's, it's kind of doing a couple of things. Well, first of all, Twitter actually put a label on this one. It decided it was spreading false information about the election, and they, they added a label in one of their new policies. This is also, again, misinformation, disinformation that's trying to um, the, uh, sow doubt about the election results. But this one is also scaring people away from the polls, so actually acting as a kind of voter suppression. So it's problematic in a, in a few different ways. Another example. Interestingly enough, this one was sent by um, uh, the president of the United States from his Twitter account. And, um, and it's another example of we're not just seeing disinformation, misinformation come up from just random accounts online. It's actually also coming from political leaders and, and media pundits as well. And so uh, it's coming from multiple sides at once and it's, it's you know, reaffirming each time someone might see it and it's false. These things are, are taken out of contents, text and, and exaggerated and you know, falsely assigning a intent, saying that a mistake represents systematic fraud. But altogether, it's actually building this idea among many people on both sides of the political spectrum that we can't trust the election results. And we're seeing networks of activists, social media influencers, and hyperpartisan media outlets picking up this evidence of voting concerns, framing that evidence in misleading ways, and strategically amplifying that content so to support these sort of meta narratives that undermine trust in the election. And I wanted to say this, democracy fails if we lose trust in the process. If we can't trust the results of our democratic elections, then our country doesn't have a functioning democracy anymore. And pervasive distrust erodes the foundations of democratic societies. 
It undermines our trust in institutions, our trust in each other, our trust in the, in the things that make us who we are. And again, it destabilizes the common ground that we need to come to stand upon together to govern ourselves. And so this is a critical challenge for all of us is to try to make, you know, is to try to fight um, pervasive disinformation. People may think that in the moment it's going to help them or their political campaign, but in the long run, it's bad for us all. So what do we do about this? So I'm going to give you a first slide of like individually what we can do, and then I'm hoping to end on a little bit of a different note. So individually, I have some recommendations that I give people, um, and they're not just mine. We're building up from, from many different research or studies, kind of building up a best practices for how do we engage in, engage in these online spaces with information, online and offline, um, but especially online. And our first recommendation is to just slow down. Before you pass something along, before you even absorb something, sit down, think about it. Think about why you might be seeing that information. Tune into your emotions. Disinformation doesn't take advantage of us cognitively. It takes advantage of us through us through our, takes advantage of us through our emotions, through our gut, right? It goes through it goes through our emotional um, our emotional engagement. It tries to to um, activate us to make us feel outrage and anger. Um, and, and, and passionate about something in order to make us do something like share it, right? So it, 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 it activates us to, to, to pass it along. And so tune into where to, to your emotions and think about how someone might be wanting you to feel that way and why they might be wanting you to feel that way. Also try to take responsibility. I kind of liken this to, to thinking about our responsibility with the vote. You know, many of you might be voting for the first or, or second time, you know, uh, in this election, maybe the first time in a presidential election. And we might think about, you know, I am only one voter. Why does my vote even matter? You know, someone's going to win by thousands of votes or hundreds of thousands of votes. So why does it matter if I vote? But if everybody says that, then it doesn't work. Right. So we all have to kind of take responsibility and collectively we make this thing work. Well, the same thing in online spaces. You could think that your tweet or your Facebook post really doesn't matter. And and how are you going to make a difference? But if everyone says that, we just let the whole thing go to go, go to pot. So what 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 can we do to make things better? Right. So take responsibility. Say, like, what can I do in my in, in my moment, in my daily activities? It, thinking that other people in their daily activities are going to do the same thing, and maybe collectively we can make a healthier information space. As part of that, be open to correction. We all make mistakes. We all sometimes, um, you know, post information that's not true. And and if we're not open to correction, then then we're part of the problem. Um, as I mentioned, I I retweeted a Russian troll. I, I learned about that. Twitter sent me a message once upon a time, and I was like, holy moly, that indeed I did. Um, and so just just think about that. Like, be you know, it happens to everyone. You don't have to punish yourself over it. But when you make a mistake, correct yourself. Go back and you know, tell your followers or tell your friends that oh, I actually, you know, I, that wasn't true. It turned out not to be true. You can update a Facebook post and say this wasn't true, and you can, you know, um, you know, add a comment to a to a Twitter post and say this turned out to be false. And you can contact people who shared your post and say, hey, you should take that down. It's not true. And I really recommend. That, that you do that. And as you do that, you can also learn how to correct others, but do it with empathy. Understand that people make mistakes and, and they don't mean to get it wrong, but sometimes they do. And so if you can try to approach people in ways that you know, say, hey, just a little nudge, like, you know, I understand why you might have thought that, but it turns out not to be true. And I think if we all kind of work together on all these things, we can develop a different set of, uh, of practices or norms or ways that we engage in online space. Hi, everybody. We get to have a moment with Dr. Kate Starbird. And, and, and Dr. Starbird, can I call you Kate? Absolutely. Okay. So I want you to start. First of all, I want to say I really, really enjoyed your, your lecture. I thought it was so pertinent and so, and so powerful and so relevant to, to where we are at this moment, not just in the state of Washington, but really in the world. So thank you. Um, I want to start, before I start with the, with the content, reflecting on your content, Take yourself back to, to Kate Starbird at Lakes High School in, in Lakewood, Washington, and the, the, the young Kate Starbird, before you made your way to Stanford, how, did you, how were you as a high school student, and how did you get to Stanford, and how did you discover your passions, both in high school and in college? That's, a, that's interesting. Um, as a high school student, I was 
very much <laughs> focused on uh, my athletic my athletics. I was playing a lot of basketball. I actually, if you if I look back to those days, I spent spent most of my time in Jensen Gym, which was a it's a gym on the military base on Fort Lewis or Joint Base Lewis and McCord now. Um, spent most of my afternoons there, and then would spend the rest of my free time, you know, doing schoolwork or on the computer. And, uh, and so the basketball kind of set up my first career, which, which I, uh, ended up being a professional basketball player for a few years after college. And then the computer programming set up my second computer uh, career, which has been, um, relying on some of those skills to do some of the kinds of analysis that we do in our, in our research. When you were in high school, did you know you wanted to do computer related work? No, I actually didn't know it was an option. Uh, I remember going to career day and I was like, oh, what's the, you know, what kind of careers are there? And I looked at the one that had the highest starting salary and I was like, oh, I, I guess I want to be a chemical engineer. And then I went off to college and that was not a good idea for me. And it was actually after my first year at Stanford that I they learned about computer science as a major. And I was like, oh, I could do computers, but, but as my major, that's awesome. So I, I actually switched uh, in my sophomore year to majoring in computer science. So you found computer science as a as a sophomore and as an athlete, which is a, which is a challenging thing to do. Eventually, you made your way to um, back, back home, back to the state of Washington, and in a field called human centered design and, and engineering. It's a relatively new field. How did you discover HCDE, and how did you find that as a passion? Yeah, it's a, it's interesting. I. Um... I did my PhD at the University of Colorado, and I initially went in um, thinking I was going to study something different, actually, in the, at the intersection of education and technology. And while I was there, I met this amazing professor, Leisha Palin. And at the time, I was like, this is the smartest person I've ever known. And I want to work with her. And what is she working on? And so it turned out she was working in this new field called crisis informatics. And I was like, well, if she's doing that, I want to do that. And so I just started, you know... Um, uh, working with her, uh, collaborating, and um, turns out that she was laying the foundations of what is now a new field, and and that uh, I and some of her other PhD students at the time got to be some of the early entrants in this in this new field where we were actually using computer science skills uh, in combination with uh, understanding of sort of social science to look at human behavior in online spaces. And, and when I graduated that degree, not sure where I was going to end up working, um, but uh, HCDE kind of has a strong overlap in looking at sort of the intersections of how people interact with technologies and other kinds of um, systems. And so HCDE turned out to be a perfect fit, and it was back in Washington, and I'm so lucky to be able to come home. You described in your talk that HCDE gets engineers to think about how to talk to people before they build things. And that's a concept that seems at once so simple and so basic, but yet so complex. So helping engineers understand how to talk to people before they build things. Describe what that, what, yeah, what we, you mean by that. We just have a, it's not just talking to people, but it's how do we understand um, how people use different kinds of systems. And we can mean digital systems. And a lot of times we think about that, but systems can be all sorts of different kinds of interact ways of interacting with um, both tech tech technology, policies, organizations, whatever it is. But thinking about just human computer, computer interaction, which is my focus within, within there, is we study how people use systems. We study how, and also what they want to do, the kinds of, not just what they're doing now with the system, but what they want to do in, in their work. What, what do they want to do to make their lives better? What do they want to do to make themselves, you know, be able to do the kind of work they want to do? And so we talk to them, we understand what their needs are, what their goals are, what their hopes are. And then we try to design things that, um, that, they, that they can use, but also that things that enable them to flourish. And, um, and more importantly, we're not just talking about individual users of systems. We're now thinking about how some of these systems that we build have billions of users. Um, and even people that aren't using the systems are affected by how, they, uh, by how these systems are in society. So you think about social media, um, billions of users, and even people that don't use it are now affected by, by some of the impacts of social media. So we start thinking about human-centered design is actually beyond just one user, but thinking about how do the things we build affect society? And in order to, to design better things for society, we have to better understand how these will interact with people. And part of that, talking to people, watching them work, understanding their hopes and goals. As I was listening to you talk during your, your lecture, and 
the work that expands to billions of people and thinking about the kind of methodologies that you use and use a range of of methodologies, clearly um, various kinds of data analysis, quantitative, qualitative, even kind of getting down to sort of following tweets. Talk about what it means to, to mix methods that way. Uh, it means it's very hard to write your methods sections and your papers go very long. Um, but no, we, uh, part of what I actually, um, took from my experiences at Colorado, where we were kind of innovating to create new methods to study, to study, you know, how people are using, uh, social media during crisis events. These are events that are happening in the moment. And it, interestingly enough, through some of these technologies, we can collect all sorts of new data about how people are responding to these disasters. But that data, um, how, how do we study it? How do we make sense of it? And so one of the things we do is we approach it quantitatively. It's big data. And so we want to look at these patterns. We want to look out at, at, at maybe finding places that don't quite fit in. But that view can often obscure what's actually going on. So instead of just reporting on the, the, the faraway patterns, we also you know, go very close up to data. And we you know, uh, sort of use ethnographic methods of, of investigation where we follow specific topics or groups of users and networks, not just in one social media platform, but across others and really, um, and, and not just, you know, with a visualization or, or a table or something else, but just reading content and, and, and interpreting that and spending a lot of time with trying to understand the context of how, of what, of what's happening and, and, and understand, you know, the how and the why, and as well as the what. So I think quantitative, you can get to kind of the what's going on here. And, um, and with some of our qualitative things, we begin to tease out some of the how and why. Hey, you're talking about work that, that impacts us all because we're also connected in, in some ways around, around the world. So the scale of your work is really important. And you talk about social networking and the the pro-social implications of, of social networking. So I want to talk about that for a minute, the pro-social, before we lead to the more complicated kinds of issues that, that affect us all. But give some examples of pro-social um, social networking. Yeah, so um, a couple of things actually from, from my dissertation, which was really focused on um, on some of the pro-social things that happen during, during the worst of times, but some of the best of human behavior during the worst of times, during crisis events. Um, one of the first events we studied was the Haiti earthquake, which was a catastrophic event and uh, lots of casualties, loss of life. And, and, but within all of that kind of really devastatingly sad um, situation, we also saw people um, coming together on social media platforms from all around the world to try to help each other and to try to help people that were there. We saw people up in French speaking Canada trying to contact and find people either on the ground in Haiti or their, their um, friends and family in other places and like fill their phones with minutes so they could communicate with the rest of the world. We saw efforts to like find uh, supplies to be sent there um, and, and help and help people in different ways. And just to see like, um, you know, this drive and it's a natural human reaction disasters. We want to respond. We want to help. We want to help others. And social media has really enabled that. And we studied case after case after case um, when I was at, at the University of Colorado. And um, we also saw like revolutions that were organized in in uh, social media spaces and in some places where, where people were, um, you know, trying to come together against uh, governments that were very oppressive. And, and a lot of us considered that to be uh, a positive use of social media at the time. And, you know, our, our views of things have changed uh, with, with some hindsight on some of the situations, but certainly um, over and over again, even in the pandemic, we saw people getting together and trying to find how to give you know, each other masks and get masks to the right people um, during the first few weeks. Uh, of the of the pandemic here in the United States, so um, it's definitely still a place where 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 we look and and, and find um, and, and we fi- find people trying to help each other. I want to come to the pandemic in a moment. Um, um, you talk about throughout your talk, you you talk about misinformation and disinformation. You make a really important distinction between the the two. So um, give a give a little primer on on misinformation and disinformation, why those two are, are so powerfully important. Yeah. So misinformation is, you know, is a kind of an umbrella term in some ways, but it, it's about anything that's um, false information, but not necessarily intentionally false information. So rumors that, that, that turn out to not to be true, but that people didn't know they were untrue at the time they created them um, would be, would be misinformation. Disinformation on the other hand, 
is information that's either false or misleading, um, but it's intentional and it's there for some kind of purpose. It's been created or spread for a specific purpose, whether a political purpose or a, or a financial one. Um, there's some other reasons that people spread disinformation as well. Um, but it has, it's, a, it's an intentional nature, and it's also not just completely false. Sometimes disinformation is just misleading. It's often built around a true core, but it layers false information with true information in order to, to mislead somebody for a reason. You used a couple of examples. Um, one is an image that many of us saw. It was a shark in the floodwaters in Houston during Hurricane Harvey. And so a, a man posts this, and he kind of thinks it's funny, but that goes that goes viral as as a truth for at least a little while. Is that misinformation or disinformation? That's an interesting case. Uh, I think when we when I first put that in my slides, uh, well, no, that was 2017. When I first put the first picture of a shark in my slides because we see that same picture over and over again in different ways. Initially, we kind of were just considering that just another form of misinformation. But now that we understand better what disinformation is, it actually depending on you know how much you want to distinguish between really problematic political disinformation. That's, this isn't that. Um, the shark is something that's not that, but it was intentional and it was probably spread um, for uh, reputational reasons to gain attention, to get likes and retweets and, and to gain attention. And also maybe to make some kind of point about how people need to be double checking the content they see. Um, and so it's on the edge of, 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 of disinformation, I would say, although I wouldn't kind of equate it to some of the, the political disinformation that we're seeing that really has a, um, a, a long term strategy behind it. This is something that's much, much lighter weight and much more targeted at, at getting attention. And so many of us, certainly in the state of Washington, if not around the world, but certainly in our in our state and many of our students can probably resonate with this during 2020 when COVID starts to spread and we're sheltering in place. Suddenly there's this move afoot for people to run to stores and buy as much toilet paper and pizza. So so I couldn't go into a store anywhere in my neighborhood and find pizza. People rushed out as if the world was going to end and that's the spreading of misinformation that just goes, and it's unwitting, it's not necessarily intentional, but it's misinformation. Talk about how that works, because this is where your work kind of gets into not just the analysis of, of social media data, but a bit of social psychology also. What's going on there? Yeah, I mean, I would even call it more sort of rumoring during a disaster event. So we had those those rumors, and the rumors were were not just that something was happening because something was, and that's, that was true. It was that, you know, that everything was going to be shut down, that we weren't going to be able to, grow, to go to grocery stores. And that was kind of driving this kind of mass, uh, you know, visitation of the grocery stores to buy everything on the shelves with this idea we weren't going to be able to go back. And certainly that it turns out that that's not how they put the sheltering in place in order. And we were able to go to grocery stores and there were other ways to get, to get supplies. But because of those rumors, it actually caused, um, sort of maladaptive behavior, which is something we see in crisis a lot, crisis events a lot, as you see a rumor that that leads people to take the, the wrong action. But it doesn't mean that that rumor was intentional. In this case, I don't think um, we did see some opportunistic amplification of those rumors that looks like disinformation, but the development of the rumors were just people that were hearing that the National Guard was being deployed, that were looking at what's happening in other countries, and came up with this explanation that that we should, you know, that we might be not able to go to the grocery stores. And and a lot of times what happens in those cases is people aren't sure that it's true, but they figure the risk that if it is true and I don't warn someone is worse than if I warn someone and it turns out not to be true. So I even heard that when my family member called me and said, hey, you better get to the grocery store. Well, we don't know if it's totally true, but just in case. And you're like, okay, just in case, um, except the problem was is that we all went to the grocery stores at the same time, which was not what you should do in the, in, during a pandemic. <laughs> You walked us through, and I thought so powerfully, and again, it seemed like you were using a bit of, of psychology in your work or social psychology in your work, because when a crisis happens, which is what you study, there's uncertainty and there's anxiety, and you called it collective sense-making. We're trying to make sense, and so we're, we're talking about information like flattening the curve and how the virus works and, and how to be safe, and then sometimes that information goes awry and something goes, goes wrong. And sometimes it's a form of exploitation. Talk about how that happens and when it becomes from a collective good and collective sense-making to exploitive. 
Yeah, no, this, and it's interesting. This all does come from the social psychology of rumor, right? And it comes, a lot of what we understand about human uh, adaptations or human behavior during disasters comes in. It's got a long history, goes back into the 1940s. Um, and, and, and one of those things is under times of uncertainty and anxiety, we don't want to experience that. We want to resolve it. We want to get rid of it. We want to, we want to know what actions to take. We want to know what's going on. And in the absence of official information, especially when the official information isn't there or the science isn't ready yet, we, um, we fill that in with our own explanations. And, and what we do is we, we want to come together to make sense of things. And in historically people would come together in physical spaces. Now we're coming together in online spaces as well. And what we do is we try to come up with explanations. We, we draw information from each other. We share what we know, and then we speculate. We come up with theories for how, what, what's happening, what's going on, what's going to happen. This is how the lockdown rumors came into place. The people are just trying to figure it out. They come up with a theory, putting together what they've heard and coming with this idea that we're about to have um, the nat National Guard lock us down. Um, and, and it serves two purposes. One is this informational purpose, but another one is a social psychological purpose of like, you're coming together, you're, you're connecting with other people. And it's such an important part of our response to disasters. And as researchers in the disaster space, we've tried not to problematize that behavior because it is, it's a natural human response. Unfortunately, the byproduct of that can be misinformation and the misinformation can be problematic. So what do we do once misinformation get, comes into the system? Maybe a little different about, about what do we mean by, by this process of collective sense making? And, and I, I wouldn't say that it's bad. I think it's good. And it's part of how we, how we respond. Unfortunately, during crisis events and other times, we can also be exploited. And we have a history of exploitation happening in crisis events. It's usually not as much as, as the myths about crisis events suggest, but it's there. Um, and certainly as we see in online spaces, as we're coming together, trying to make sense of things, we're susceptible to misinformation, we're susceptible for, to disinformation and manipulation as well. And increasingly we're seeing that in our online spaces after disaster events. And this pandemic has just really um, demonstrated that at, at, at a length and, and a scale that we hadn't seen before. You've called and in this study and I've seen you in this talk and, and I've seen you talk about this COVID-19 as, as the perfect storm. Um, what makes it the perfect storm right right now? And this also speaks to the importance of your work right right now, um, Kate. So talk about it as as the perfect storm. Yeah, there's so many factors. The first one is just you know uncertainty. If uncertainty is what sort of stirs the rumor mill, um, COVID nineteen was perfect. So if you look at an earthquake or a hurricane, which is what we normally study for crisis events most of the uncertainty resolves very quickly. We begin to learn what areas have been impacted, you know, power comes on again, people are able to report out of their neighborhoods and we get a pretty good sense of what's going on. There's some persistent uncertainty, but most of it resolved very quickly. With COVID-19, we have had long periods, you know, we're still sitting in like persistent scientific uncertainty about how does the disease spread? How fatal is it? How many people are susceptible? Who's the most susceptible? How does it, you know, who, who's spreading it? You know, how, how, does, how well do social distancing efforts work? Do masks work? How well do they work in what environments? So all of these different things, and we're still figuring things out. And people have this expectation that science can just figure it out. No, science is, it takes a while to figure these things out. And with that kind of pers you know, persistent period of, of uncertainty, um, that rumor mill kept, kept, kept stirring or kept spinning. On top of that, we have these, uh, these, these informational conditions where we're, you know, we're getting information online in our online spaces. We already have a situation. We have pervasive disinformation where people are trying to exploit us in those spaces um, prior to the pandemic. And certainly afterwards, um, we've got increasing numbers of like people that are participating in sort of conspiracy theorizing communities. And, um, and, and with all of that, we also have sort of diminished trust in information sources uh, overall, um, which, you know, skepticism can be good, but too much skepticism or skepticism in everything can be bad, especially in a, in a pandemic where you need to know that you can trust the official, the official communicators. And over time, we've lost trust in those communicators. Those communicators have actually made, made mistakes, become politicized. Um, and, and, and that's made, you know, and further kind of eroded trust in, in some of the, the places that we should have been going for, for information that we could trust. And then across this whole space, the information spaces, the, the communicators, this, this um, 
hyper politicization of everything, which means that no, if someone's saying something and the, and their political identity is is often wrapped up in what they're saying, you know, what they're saying, then someone on the other side is already motivated not to trust them, right? And then and, and then also people are trying to score political points with everything, uh, and that can be um, and. It, I think that's that's leading to us being more vulnerable, um, and it's also leading to kind of the proliferation of of misinformation and disinformation. So it, you talk about a misleading article that that goes viral, or a story disinformation regarding civil war in, in Syria. Um, where's the onus when it comes to responsibility for this? If if I put, post on Facebook an article that's just inaccurate or, or misinterprets research. Is that responsibility mine to, to not do that? Or is it to the, to the reader to be informed, for the public to be informed? Where's the onus in your mind? This is a great question. One of our first papers on misinformation, we did these interviews with people who had shared a false rumor about um, the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings. There was a lot of false rumor spreading after that. And we went and interviewed people who had shared a false rumor and then had either chosen to correct it or not. And we ended up coming with this up with this whole thing about different locus of responsibility. Some people said, oh, it's my responsibility, but that was very few. That was often it was the journalists who had responded to us who said it was my responsibility. I should have done better. But a lot of people said, no, it was the original person who shared it. They should have done, you know, they should have vetted it you know, they put me in a bad position. And then some people said, no, it's not my fault for sharing it. It's the people who retweeted it after me. They should have, you know, they should have done better. Like the guy who shared the shark, right? His idea was that other people should have done, should have vetted it before retweeting him, right? So there were all these people pointing the fingers at, at someone else. Um, and so I, I do think when we think about these things, it's like, the platforms have responsibility for, for facilitating it. Certainly journalists have responsibility and often actually the most likely to take it in terms of considering our research when we've talked to people, the journalists were much more likely to say, it's my responsibility. But I think we as individual users have responsibility to do a better job of vetting and correcting ourselves. Um, and certainly uh, it's gonna take all of us kind of um, uh, becoming savvier and more, more willing to take, to take that responsibility. I think there was a time where, you know, as we're coming into this new ways of interacting, engaging with information, I don't think we knew where to assign that, but I do think we need to learn how to take more responsibility ourselves um, and then learn how to correct ourselves and correct others. As I mentioned in the talk, I think will be an important kind of shift if we can manage to do it. Now I have a, a a complicated question for, for you. So we talked about the pandemic as if that wasn't big enough. Now, um, you, Kate, who, who does this really important research now, and it's the 2020 election. And a, again, you're studying misinformation and disinformation. And you make reference to when misinformation or disinformation in the form of tweets comes from the White House. Now, what's it like as a as an associate professor at the University of Washington, an up and coming star in your field to actually take on data that actually is coming from the most powerful source in the United States. What's that like for you to take up that, that discourse of when there's misinformation and disinformation coming from the president of the United States? Yeah, it's a difficult, it is a difficult question. Um, Little background is we're trying to do real time or rapid analysis on disinformation about the election, very specifically about voting and about um, election integrity. And we started this project and we were all ready to go. We're ready to do analysis. And the first three opportunities were actually tweets from the White House or, or actually from President Trump. They didn't come out of the White House account. They came out of his personal account. Um, and it is an interesting thing. And they, these were tweets that uh, the platforms themselves, like Twitter, had put a label on it to say that this was misinformation or, or to say that it was, um, you know, uh, misinformation or problematic in some other way. It's hard because we don't see ourselves as partisan in the sense that we are fighting for a particular party or we're trying to struggle to, to you know, lift, you know, left or right. We do see ourselves as trying to protect democracy 
and understanding that for a democracy to function, we have to be able to trust our election results. We have to be able, you know, we have to have trust that these processes are working. And when they're not working, we should call that out and try to make it work. Um, but calling, you know, but trying to just cast doubt on the results, as, as we've seen from the president in this cycle, um, is actually, he might, maybe he perceives it having short-term benefits for him, but in the long term, it's detrimental for democracy. And so we've really tried to anchor ourselves on this value of democracy and, and, and say, so we're not, we're not, we're not trying to be partisan, but when one side is attacking democracy and our value is democracy, it may appear that we, that we're partisan, but in reality, we're really just trying to, to protect these, um, these things that we care about as, as, you know, um, people in democratic society. And, and that, and that it helps guide our work. Another thing that guides our work is I've been threatened by people on the far left and the far right for work that I've done. So at this point, it, it, it doesn't, it kind of, you always feel a little bit nervous, um, because nobody wants to be, you know, attacked or, or put yourself out there. But um, if, if you're going to make a difference in some of these spaces, the people that are that like to spread disinformation and manipulate things online are going to target you. And so we understand that sometimes we're going to be the targets of disinformation our campaigns ourselves and have already experienced that. But it's part of the goes with the uh, goes with the territory, I guess. We've been fighting in this country a lot in 2020, Kate, and one of those those the battle lines has been Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter. And I recall watching in social media thinking that divides here are so, so powerful and so strong and so differentiated. Um, and even wondered if those divides don't, didn't seem um, constructed. And it turns out so much of the divisions between Black Lives Matter groups and those opposing actually were socially constructed. They were created. Um, and almost puppeteers playing playing out. And you describe that in your talk. Say a bit about what that phenomenon is and how we and how we keep that from happening. This is difficult because I mean, if we look at Black Lives Matter, we see you know essentially an organic movement that is arguing uh, legitimately against um, systemic racism, violence against African Americans by police. Um, and when initially we started studying that, it was an undergraduate student leading a study, and he was looking at how how those, those arguments were framed. And then we, then we began to look at how they were counterframed, how, how Blue Lives Matter you know, reframed what Black Lives Matter was trying to do, reinterpreted how they were kind of t talking about you know, why we should talk about Black Lives Matter because the, you know, the world is set up to treat Black Lives as if they don't matter. But Blue Lives Matter reinterpreted that, reframed it in their, in their own thing and kind of, and, and this was, this was not the the results of somebody outside. This, these are you know these are you know at the, at, the, at the beginning and in their essence these are American divisions and these are problems within our own country. But we also saw that a foreign country was trying to interfere with our political process, decided to or elected to use that as an opportunity to make things worse, to um, infiltrate those different communities and to pull them apart even more. And you could see them trying to aggravate the situation. They organize Russia, Russian agents organize protests on both sides of that, that, com that conversation, protests in the United States. They, they also ran uh, social media accounts on both sides and they, and they acted as pu puppeteers having arguments with themselves um, and, and, and saying very divisive things and just trying to stir up more of the com controversy. So it's a fault line that's it's ours as, as a country, but it's a fault line that can be exploited. And we can, we're seeing exploited by domestic actors, we're seeing exploited by foreign actors for their own political purposes in ways that don't help us solve the problem. And I think that's what that's what that research for us was about. It's like, it's, it's not that these aren't real problems that we're trying to deal with as a country, but that people are making these problems worse on purpose for, for political purposes that have nothing to do with solving these problems. You took us into a process that that talks about the the issues that are, are a threat to our democracy. And at some point, you say democracy will fail if we lose trust in our process. Disinformation erodes the foundation of our democracy. And then you make this lovely transition to making a set of recommendations that seem so pragmatic. I don't know if you remember the recommendations off the top of your head. Slow down. Can you walk us through those recommendations? I think they're so important. 
Uh, yeah, and that's slow down. I mean, I mean, these are recommendations for people in online information environments. We're not just consumers anymore. We're participants. And um, yeah, to, to slow down, to tune into our emotions, because we're, we're not manipulated here. We're manipulated through, um, through emotional reactions that get us, that activate us to do things like vote or not vote or protest. Um, so to tune into our emotions and where we might be manipulated and to learn how to correct ourselves and learn how to correct others and to take responsibility when we do spread misinformation, to understand that we're vulnerable, it happens. You don't have to beat yourself up about it. Just fix it. Uh, and then if you can, if you see an opportunity to help someone else, reach out and do it in an empathetic way, understanding that they're probably trying to get things right themselves. You know, they're passionate about something. They think they're good people for the most part. And so to understand that so many of us get pulled into to sharing these things that are making things worse. And if we step back and, and learn how to be a little bit more, um, you know, just engage in a, in a healthier way, I think um, we could do a lot towards improving the health of these spaces. What I appreciated so much was you took us through some of the most complicated issues really in our, in our world, in our, in our society, to a place of hope. And you mentioned to me that you actually would have put a last slide in your talk had you had, you had time. So describe, and I'm going to give you the final word. What would your last slide be, and what would your message of hope be to students and to our community, Kate? My, the last slide is actually a, a, a picture of people chipping away on the Berlin Wall. Um, you know, after it was falling, but they're chipping away to take the last pieces down. And, and my, my thing is that we need to chip away. These are actually pr pretty overwhelming problems right now. They can seem overwhelming where so many of us are, are being affected in so many ways by the things that are going on. Um, but that we can't give up hope. We have to learn that we're not going to solve these things with one new, you know, widget on, on the social media site. We're not going to solve it with one new education program. We're not going to solve it with one new policy from the government. But if we all get together and begin to come up with creative ways of improving things, you know, creative ideas, yes, we can design these platforms differently. Yes, there can be better policies about how we interact in online spaces. And yes, we can learn how to be um, more productive and healthier uh, participants in these environments. And for me, I put that off on my students at the end of my, my talk and say, you're the ones that are going to design these, these solutions. You've you, you have to have hope and we can't be, we can't be confident right now that everything's going to get fixed, but we have to be hopeful and we have to start thinking about how we can make things better. Kate Starbert, thank you for being so courageous as a researcher and courageous as a person. And thank you for giving us hope.